Welcome to this week's virtual drasha. I want to begin by thanking Jeremy Diamond for dedicating the drasha this week in commemoration of the yard site of his father, Mr. Abe Diamond, Zichron Levracha Avram, Tzvi Ben Pesach Hillel. We hope that in the merit of our Talmud Torah, the Neshama will have an aliyah and the family a Nechama. We have the incredible privilege this week to read Parshas B'Shalach. And in Parshas B'Shalach, we read the incredible story of Yitzhiyas, I'm sorry, the Exodus. Now, although really the Exodus happened in last week's parsha, the end of Parshas Bo, but it's really in this week's parsha that we read about what I'll call it the concretization, right? The, the, the Exodus is concretized, it's solidified in this week's parsha with the splitting of the sea, the Jewish people emerging on the other side, and the waters coming crashing down on the Egyptians. That marked, really marked the end of Egyptian servitude before the Jews saw the downfall of their former masters. But in the moments before the sea is split, I think are some of the tensest moments in the entire Torah. The Jewish people, the nation of Israel, lose it. They look behind them, they see the pursuing Egyptian army. They look in front of them, they see the raging sea. And so they turn on Moshe. They turn on Moshe, what did you do? You, you, sold, the, you, you sold us a fake dream, sold us a bill of goods. You told us you were going to take us out to be free. Destiny, Eretz, Yisrael, Torah, all beautiful, and now we're going to die. We're going to die right here by the banks of the Red Sea. This is why you took us out to die in the desert. It would be better to die in Egypt. So they're losing it. And Moshe Rabbeinu tells them, Hashem yilochem lochem v'atem tachayushin. Stop, stop, stop. Just be quiet. <laughs> Just be quiet. Hashem will fight your battles. You be quiet. And then Hashem says something amazing to Moshe. Ma Why are you crying out to me? Daber el b'nei Yisrael v'yiso. Tell the Jewish people, to move forward. And then he goes on, you raise your staff. This is in Perak Yudala, chapter 14, verse 15. Extend the staff on the uh, upon the sea. You'll split the sea and the people will go. Yisrael will go into the sea and the seabed will become dry land. And there's a very there's something very bothersome about this exchange. When Hashem says to Moshe, why are you crying out to me? When you read those words, it almost appears as if the Ribbono Shol Olam is upset with Moshe for his supplication, for his prayer, for his reaching out, for the dialogue with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And why would Hashem be upset? Moshe Rabbeinu is in charge of a million, millions of people. He also sees the Egyptians in front and the sea in front, the Egyptians in back, excuse me, and the Jews in and sorry, and the sea in front. So why can HaKadosh Baruch Hu get upset? at Moshe Rabbeinu for going ahead and crying out. So Rashi explains that Hashem's not really upset. What Hashem was saying is, listen Moshe, you yourself just said it. Hashem yilachem lachem v'atem tacharishin. You just told the people, guys, calm down. God's got this. He's got your back. He's going to fight the battle. So Hashem is telling Moshe, just like you told them to calm down, I'm telling you to calm down. Just walk. Just go. You know exactly what you have to do. But still, the pshuto shal mikra, when you read the words of the Pasik, it's still, to me, it comes across as bothersome. It comes across as difficult that you almost see HaKadosh Baruch Hu getting upset at Moshe Rabbeinu for reaching out in dialogical connection, for reaching out in tefillah, for supplicating, for asking for HaKadosh Baruch Hu's help and guidance and how are we to understand the divine response to Moshe Rabbeinu's tefillah. You know, this past week, on the 14th of Shvat, was the yard site of the Pene Yoshua. Rav Yoshua Falk, Rav Yaakov Yoshua Falk, lived from 1680 to 1755 and was one of the great rabbinic personalities of his generation. He served as the Rav in Lvov, then in Berlin, in Metz, and ultimately in Frankfurt. And the Pene Yoshua, known by the name of his Sefer Pene Yoshua, is a seminal work on the Gemara, combining various earlier sources, often with a, with a focus on trying to bring the halacha, trying to bring the final conclusion. It's, it's an expansive work on Shas. And in the introduction to the Pene Yoshua, the author, Rav, Yoshua, Rav Yaakov Yoshua Falk, discusses why he wrote this Sefer. You know, a lot of times when, we, when we're reading something, and we often like gloss over the introduction. You want to get to the meat and potatoes. You want to get to the book. But it's interesting because introductions often contain, first of all, a little bit about the author, and also sometimes tell you about the motivation the author had for writing the particular work. So Rav Yaakov Yoshua Falk, the Pnei Yoshua, tells the story which inspired this seminal work. And he writes about it as follows. He says, I was, it was one day, he describes that day was the third of Kislev, the year was, the Hebrew year was 5463, which translates into the year November 23rd, 1702. So on November 23rd, 1702, the Pnei Yoshua says he was living in Lvov, 
says, I was sitting in my base medrash and life was good. Life was serene. Everything was beautiful. Lavav was a bustling community. The Pnei Yoshua was the Rav. Rav Yaakov Yoshua Falk was the Rav. He was married. He had a child. Everything. He had Talmidim. He had students. He had a yeshiva. He gave shir. Life was beautiful. Life was serene. And then he writes, Upesa Pisom. But then suddenly, Haisa Meir Legalafucha. My city became reduced to rubble. Now what he's referring to is that in the city of Lvov on November 23rd, 1702, there were a number of warehouses of gunpowder. Somehow, a fire started and the warehouses exploded and caused multiple explosions and fires throughout the city, almost decimating the Jewish city at that, at that particular time. And the Pnei Yoshua writes, I'm sitting in my base medrash, everything is wonderful. And then I hear a series of explosions to the point that even the building in which the Pnei Yoshua was learning in collapsed. And the Pnei Yoshua describes the events of that day. He says, on that day, November 23rd, 1702, I lost my wife. My wife passed away. My in-laws, my wife's parents, passed away as well. And he writes over here something so gripping. He says, Ad gamkein litzaras habas. Until tragedy struck my daughter, Biti hakitana. Achos haisa li'ima v'chaviva alai biyoser. I had one child, one little daughter, and she was the most precious thing to my wife and I. And she too perished in the fires in Lvov on November 23rd, 1702. And the Rav Yaakov Yoshua Falk then goes on to describe, he said, I was buried beneath rubble. And I realized that I cannot survive like this. I had lost so much on that day. And I realized that I would not... I, probably was not going to survive, but I said, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, if you allow me to survive this, if you allow me to get out of this circumstance, I make to you the following promise. If you are with me, I'm reading to you from the introduction of the Pnei Yoshua. And you, you save me from this place. The Pnei Yoshua says, I promise you I'm going to devote my life to Torah. I'm going to learn, I'm going to teach, and listen to what he writes. And I am going to go ahead and produce a work I will produce a work on the entire Talmud that will go ahead and survey all of the opinions and ultimately try to bring these discussions to a lamaisa, to a practical conclusion, a halachic conclusion. This was the promise that the Pnei Yoshua made while being buried under rubble, November 23rd, 1702, in the city of Lvov. And he said, no sooner did I finish uttering that promise, that I heard above people beginning to remove the rubble, beginning to remove the rubble. And after a couple of hours, I was extracted from the rubble and miraculously intact. He had lost so much that day. He lost Talmidim. He lost his base medrash. He lost his wife. He lost his precious daughter. But he emerged from that rubble with a renewed purpose. Purpose to change the face of Klal Yisrael, to do something that had never been done before. And after he cleared away, wiped away his tears, he set out on his new mission. And I've always been struck by this introduction because I feel it's an incredible metaphor for life as well. Because often we feel buried under the rubble of life. I feel like life is bearing down on me. My circumstances feel so overwhelming and so difficult and I can't catch my breath and there's sorrows and there's all this stuff and I just, I just feel buried. I just feel buried underneath the rubble of life. So what do you do when you're buried underneath the rubble of life? What do, what do, you, what do you do? There's a choice. You could close your eyes and just drift away. You could give up. You could give up. And sometimes it's very enticing to give up because the rubble is so heavy. And it's so difficult to breathe. And I feel like there's a million pounds sitting on my chest. And so sometimes the natural thing almost feels like, just give up. Just close your eyes. Just give up. Or a person could say no. Although the rubble is heavy, the burden is heavy, and I feel overwhelmed. There are things I have to accomplish. There are things I have to do. And I promise that if I find a way out of this trouble, if I find a way to navigate out of these circumstances, I'm going to accomplish A and B and C. I'm not going to give up. I'm not closing my eyes because I have a life to live. 
I have things to do. I have contributions to make and I have change to affect. The Pnei Yoshua chose the second approach. After everything he lost, he could have also closed his eyes and allowed his neshama to drift into Olam Haba. He could have done that. But he chose instead to fight. He chose instead to resist succumbing. He chose instead to make a Kabbalah, to make a promise about how to move his life forward even after all of, oh, even after the rubble claimed so much from him. And perhaps this is what HaKadosh Baruch Hu is saying to Moshe Rabbeinu. You know, Moshe Rabbeinu is standing at the banks of the Red Sea and he's crying out to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Moshe, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? How are you going to save us? And HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells Moshe Rabbeinu, one second, why are you crying out to me? What am I going to do? What are you, you, capital Y, what are you, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, going to do? HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, Moshe, I have a better question. What are you, lowercase y, Moshe Rabbeinu, what are you going to do? You see, HaKadosh Baruch Hu realized that Moshe in that moment was in a state of what we call, you know, a certain, a, we call crisis paralysis. Right? Sometimes we encounter crisis where we're buried in the, underneath the rubble and we become paralyzed. I can't get out of this. There's nothing for me to do. There's no way out. There's no strategy. Moshe Rabbeinu was a shtickle paralyzed. He was paralyzed. He's crying out to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, what should I do? What should I do? Or better yet, he was saying to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, what are you going to do? How are you going to help me? And HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to Moshe, take a deep breath. Save your breath. Don't, don't, don't yell at me. <laughs> don't cry out to me. Don't even dive into me right now. Because the question you should be asking is not, what is God going to do? The question you need to be asking, Moshe, is what is Moshe going to do? What is Moshe going to do? And then HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Kaddish Baruch Hu models for Moshe the right approach because if you look at the next passage, he says Ve'ata Moshe so let me tell you because you're, you're a little bit paralyzed so let me tell you what you need to do Ve'ata Harim Ismatcha lift up your stick Neteas Yatcha extend your hand Alayam over the sea and split the sea it's almost as if Hashem says it to Moshe so matter of factly you're asking me God what are you going to do? no Moshe that's the wrong question in crisis the question to ask is not what is God going to to do. The question to ask is, what am I going to do? When I'm buried underneath the rubble, what am I going to do? Rabbi Yaakov Yoshua Falk, Zechet Tzadeh, Vekadosh Narachah, the Pnei Yoshua lost everything, buried underneath the rubble. Obviously, he can't save himself, so that he needs HaKadosh Baruch Hu to save him. But in that moment, when he's buried underneath the rubble, he doesn't ask God, what are you going to do for me? He says, God, let me tell you, if you help me get out of this, here's what I'm going to do for you. And so as Moshe Rabbeinu stands at the banks of the Red Sea and he's asking for HaKadosh Baruch Hu, what are you going to do? HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, no, ma lai. Wrong question, Moshe. In times of crisis, don't ask what God is going to do. Ask what Moshe is going to do. Ask what I am going to do. Don't ask what HaKadosh Baruch Hu is going to do. And I think this presents for us such an incredible lesson. So first of all, when we find ourselves buried underneath the rubble of life, it is natural to feel paralyzed. It is natural to feel powerless. I have no options. I have no abilities. There's no way to navigate out, but it's not true. If the Pnei Yoshua could be a forward-thinking individual after having lost so much and literally, not metaphorically, literally being buried underneath the rubble, then when we are buried underneath the rubble of crisis in life, we have to be like the Pnei Yoshua as well. And it's not about what God could do. You know, so many times in life we encounter crisis and our automatic like, like default is, okay, here's what I need everyone to do in order to extricate me from crisis. I need God to do this. I need my spouse to do this. I need my sibling to do this. I need my kids to do this. I need my Rebbe to do this. I need the custodian to do this. I need the mailman to do this. If everybody does their part, then I can be extracted from the rubble of crisis of life. And it doesn't work that way. Don't depend on other people to extricate you from your crisis. If you want to be extricated from the rubble of life, don't ask what other people are going to do for you, but ask what you are going to do for yourself. Do we have a right to ask HaKadosh Baruch Hu for assistance? Of course. And all of us are wise enough to know that no matter how much effort you put in life, nothing ever comes to fruition or is actualized without the Ribbon without Siyat Deshmaya, without divine providence and assistance. 
But sometimes we use God as a little bit of an escape. Sometimes we put all of the responsibility on HaKadosh Baruch Hu. It's all the Ribbon Shal Olam. Of course, in a theological sense, everything is all the Ribbon Shal Olam. But the irony of ironies is that so many times when we lift our eyes heavenward and say, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, what are you going to do for me? The Ribbon Shal Olam is like nodding his head and he's saying, no, wrong question, wrong question. You shouldn't be asking what I, God, am going to do for you. You need to be asking what you are going to do for yourself. When you are buried underneath the rubble, when you are buried underneath crisis, when you are overwhelmed by difficult circumstances, don't let them paralyze. But ask yourself one simple question. What are you going to do to extricate yourself from those challenges and from those difficulties? And if we find the courage to do so, it's amazing, something amazing happens. The sea splits, the rubble is removed, and we find ourselves in the position to accomplish something great. Wishing everyone a wonderful day and a good nerve Shabbos.